Revelation chapter number 1. Last time we were together in our study, we looked at Revelation 1 and verse number 10, where John was on the island of Patmos uh, on the Lord's day, and we talked about the distinction between why we worship on Sunday on the first day of the week, when a lot of other folks worship on Saturday and you know other things. But remember, at the time of John's writing of this book, uh, there was no name given to days of the week. It was the first day, uh, the second day, the third day, and so on and so forth. They didn't call it Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and all that. That wasn't even in existence at the time of the writing of the Revelation. And the Christians did not say at that time, well, it's Sunday, we've got to go to church, you know. Sunday was not even in existence at that point. And uh, they simply recognized that as the Lord's Day, every seventh day was the Lord's Day there, you know, it was the first day of the week they called it. That came about later as well. But in the sacred scriptures, the Bible clearly says that the Lord was resurrected on the first day of the week. Look at, you're in the Revelation, hold your finger there. But turn over to Luke chapter number 24, Luke 24, and we'll see uh, what I'm talking about. Luke 24, we're going to read verses 1 through 3. It's a familiar passage, but I just want you to see where the Bible does say this. It's not just me saying it. Luke 24, verse 1, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Why? Because he was resurrected. But the key there is upon the first day of the week. Okay? And that's how they understood it. There was no such thing as Mondays and Tuesdays. The Bible is our authority in all manner of faith and practice. It does not matter what our great aunt Ruth says, okay, about all these things. It only, only matters what the Bible says. It, if the Bible doesn't say it, it's just not so. And it doesn't matter what man's religion says either. Uh, I spoke to somebody here recently as well about Good Friday, and I unfortunately had to break it to them that Christ wasn't crucified on Friday. And they was like, what? What are you talking about? And, they, you know, they had no concept of it. And I just said, well, just think about it for a second. And I outlined the, you know, he was going to be in the, the, the grave uh, three days and three nights. And I just asked the person, I said, can you see three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday morning? Well, I never thought about it that way. You know, so there's a lot of things out there that people have supposed that are just not true. But soon after the writing of Revelation, the names of the days of the week began to come into existence. Although they still were not called Sunday and Monday and Tuesday, they were called by other pagan goddess names uh, in different languages. English wasn't even in existence at this time. And uh, it was not until much later that English names of our days of the week were brought into light by a strong Anglo-Saxon and Germanic influence, and mostly because of the pagan influences of different gods. Uh, Monday evolved from... Another word which I can't even pronounce that kind of looks like Monday if you look at it, but it's Monday came along soon long after this. But, you know, that's another study for another time, but we're going to move on tonight. But I just wanted you to know that John made a point to tell us that he was on the island of Patmos on the Lord's Day, which is important for us as Christians because we worship on the first day of the week. So tonight we want to look at verse 11. Revelation 1 verse 11 and the Bible says saying I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last what thou seest write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and Pergamos and unto Thyatira Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea one point I want to make here I made this point in the beginning of our study uh, this whole thing of, of, of commentators and preachers telling you that each one of these churches represents a period of church history, and that was what the intention of the Lord was. I just, it's, I don't see that biblically. Uh, but what I do see is uh, where the Bible says right here in the verse that we just read, verse 11, he told John, what thou seest, write in a book 
and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. God had specifically given John reason to send it to seven specific churches. Notice what it says. Seven churches which are in Asia. It doesn't say all of the churches in Asia. It says the seven churches. So, and then he names them one after another. And, and think, think about it this way. From where John stood on the island of Patmos, if he was to look to the east, okay, which is in, roughly in this direction, if he was to look to the east, he would see, you know, if he could see all at once, he would see these seven churches in sort of a semicircle. And the first one that was the furthest to the east was where he would see Ephesus and uh, the church at Ephesus. And uh, he would have been facing, as he turned east, he would have been facing all seven of those churches or where they were located geographically. And they would be in that semicircle. And so when the book of Revelation was completed and it left the island of Patmos, by whatever means it did, we're not really sure about that, the person carrying the book that was heading east, whoever that was, would have come to the first church, which would have been Ephesus in that semicircle. And from there, he would go up to the, the next church with Smyrna and so on and so on and so on, all the way and follow that semicircle around till he got to the last church, which would have been Laodicea. So when it was completed, that's how it made its rounds. But it was given to those seven churches for the specific reason of Christ rebuking six and encouraging one uh, and and. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't believe that was the reason. So this thing about church age and history and all this other stuff. Here's the thing. In every one of these churches, you can find characteristics that you still find in the church today. They, they, they're identified. Philadelphia would have been like the missionary church, if you will. We send missionaries today. So why is it different then? It, I don't see that that is the case at all. I believe it was intended for the seven churches, and that's what it was. And it was intended also to bring encouragement and to bring uh, uh, other things to uh, Christians. Remember we told you at the beginning of our study that it was written to the servants of the Lord. Not just the people who come in and sit on the pews and don't want to do anything, don't want to get involved. They just want to get their card punched. I was there Sunday. No, it was given to the churches. So notice all the texts. Uh, like I said earlier, it doesn't say churches of Asia. It says the seven. The seven that were selected by God to receive this book of Revelation. That brings us to verse number 12. This is a perfect example. Listen, why the words in our Bible are critical. Look at what it says in verse 12. He says, I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Notice what it says. It says, I turned to see. It doesn't say I turned and heard. It says I turned to see. Why is that important? Because in other words, John was going to see with his own eyes whom it was that was speaking to him. And we know who it was. It was Jesus Christ himself. John saw the Lord and he saw him speak these words. It wasn't just a voice that he heard out in the ozone somewhere. He saw, uh, the Bible says he, he, he turned to see. That means he was seeing with his own eyes who it was speaking to him. Listen, Revelation is not a spiritual, or excuse me, not a mysterious book. As, as some will, you know, you hear people say, well, the book of Revelation, I, I just don't get it. I don't understand any of it. I, I read it, but it doesn't make any sense to me, etc." Well, it might just be because somebody is not studying things properly. And when I say properly, what I mean is reading the text, looking at the words, letting the words mean what they say, and stop trying to read into it uh, and make it say things that it just does not say. Uh, in other words, I've said this to you before, we don't need to interpret the Bible, we just need to uh, read it for what it says and, you know, cross-reference with other scripture, scripture upon scripture, you know, precept upon precept like the Bible tells us. You know, for years when I was first studying the Bible, I would read what other men, and I know you probably have done this too, let's just be honest, right? I would read what other men had to say about particular passages and then I would just simply repeat what they said. 
Well, that's not studying. Hey, it's okay to, to look at commentaries to get some guidance and get some thoughts and insight on things. Maybe they have an insight that you just don't have. But we should always study ourselves. The Bible says study thyself to show thyself approved, right? And that's why it's important. After doing a more disciplined study later in my ministry, and, look, and as I look more closely at the actual text of the Bible, I began to discover that most of the things that I didn't understand, if I just stuck with it long enough and read a little bit more and studied a little bit more of the text, things would be right before my eyes. And I'm going to show you a great example of that tonight. Uh, I'm excited about this. I, this is just, uh, this is, uh, to me, is just great stuff. But uh, the problem was before, I just hadn't taken the time to study. For instance, when we read Revelation 1 and verse 12, we see reference made, look back there again, reference made to seven golden candlesticks. Okay? When in truth... What we're seeing here, if we were to stop reading right there, and we were to say, seven golden candlesticks, what does that mean? I mean, what in the world? Uh, in the past, what I would have done is I would have gone to a commentary and said, what does he mean by this? What is, I don't get this. Well, if we just keep reading, we're going to find out very clearly a lot about these candlesticks. If we stop reading there, we would have to you know, take a guess at what was meant. We would find all kinds of thoughts on what these are, what they supposedly represent. And Revelation is one of those books where a lot of men have said, well, it says horse, but it really doesn't mean horse. It means uh, uh, M1 tank or some other silly thing. Now, there are typologies in the Bible. We know that that's true. But what we have to remember is, if common sense makes perfect sense, there is no other sense. When in truth, we simply could have found out what we were reading, or what it was if we read just a little bit further. So in verse 12, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Drop down to verse 20. The Bible says in verse 20, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now look at this next part. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. It doesn't get any clearer than that. They're the seven churches. That's what the Bible says. So why would we just, why would we want to keep searching to figure out what these candlesticks are? When the Bible tells us exactly what they are. Now let me be clear. In the Old Testament, and this is important, in the Old Testament there was a seven-pronged candlestick called a menorah. We know what they look like, right? That's the Jewish candlestick that you see around Hanukkah time and all that. It was in the, in the tabernacle. It was in the temple. Uh, God made it. But what we're reading here in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12, the golden candlesticks is not that. And that's a common error that a lot of folks make. They, they think that when they read the seven, seven golden candlesticks, they picture menorah. It's not that. And I'm going to prove it to you with the scripture tonight. These are seven independent candlesticks, singular from one another. It's not a menorah. This shows us clearly, although that Christ is the head of the church, we know that's true, the church is now manifest on earth in separate local congregations. Faith Baptist Church would be an example of a separate, independent, autonomous, local Baptist church. We don't have to answer to anybody except God. And that's the way God designed it, by the way. He designed it to be that way, and that's why these are seven individual candlesticks, not associated with one another at all, other than the fact that he's talking about it here in this text. If it were the menorah, 
form, as some have tried to tell you that it is, that would give credit to the one head over the church because the base of the candle of the menorah would be like Christ and then all these other things coming off. Well, here's what happens. The Catholics have taken and they've put a person in there. And this one person oversees all of the Catholic churches. You know him as the Pope. That was not God's design. The New Testament is full of examples. It's, it's, it's example after example that that is not God's plan. And that is not what is being talked about here. Let me show you a proof text of what I'm telling you. Look at Exodus chapter number 25. Exodus chapter number 25. Look at verse 31. Exodus 25, verse 31. This is in the preparation stage for the tabernacle. And the Bible says, And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knobs, and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, three branches of the candlestick out of the other side, three bowls made like unto almonds with a knob and a flower in one branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch with a knob and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick, and in the candlestick shall be four bowls made unto almonds with their knobs and their flowers, and there shall be a knob under two branches of the same, and a knob under two branches of the same, and a knob under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. Their knobs and their branches shall be of the same. All it shall be one beaten work of pure gold, and thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall, sh and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. Now, does that sound anything like what we read in the Revelation? doesn't. The only thing that would kind of tie the two together is the word candlestick, right? Everything else would be well in addition to that. And, and, uh, and I'll show you a little bit more here in just a minute. But this is a totally different description than what we see in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12. The problem that we have as humans is when we study the Bible, we have a tendency to read things in that are not really there or not true or accurate. In the Old Testament, listen, people had a visible unity for God. How did they do that? They did it because they all met corporately at one place, the tabernacle. God said, I want all my people to come to one place and worship. So they had a visible unity. They were, they were unified. They were identified as God's people because they all went to the same place. And it was evidenced by that tabernacle where God met with his people corporately. But in the New Testament, when Christ comes on the scene, God's true children, and I'm talking about true children, those that have been born again into the family of God, we now have a spiritual unity centered on Christ. Christ is what brings us together. But we don't have to, everybody doesn't have to go to the same place. God doesn't determine that everybody living in California has to come to Winooski to worship. Why? Because the place is no longer the central thing. Christ is the central thing. And you can, well, you can worship Christ at a church in in California, as well as we can worship Christ here in the city of Winooski at Faith Baptist Church. The unity is not on the place, it's on the person of Christ. Okay? No, down in the south, there's churches where pastors will stand in their church on Sunday mornings and they'll say this. They'll say that our church, whatever it is, our church of Christ, as an example, is the only true church. And yet, just across town, there'll be a church of the same denominational faith where the pastor will stand in the pulpit and he'll say, our church is the only one true church. Yet, on every other day of the week, 
They won't associate with anyone. They won't associate with each other even of the same denominations. You know why? Because of the color of their skin. Christ is not in that. The color of one's skin makes absolutely no difference to God. He created all how in the world can either of those two churches be representative of Christ with that kind of a mindset? They can't. Now keep in mind, there are some Christians who attend unscriptural churches. I didn't say that they weren't saved. And I didn't say that they can't be saved going to an unscriptural church. What I'm saying is, if they're not following the word of God, they're not a Bible-believing church. And unfortunately, there's a lot of churches who follow the Bible 75% of the time. There's saved people in those churches that follow the Bible 75% of the time. There's some churches who have saved people in them that follow the Bible 50% of the time. There's saved people that go to the Catholic church because it doesn't matter where you go to church to be saved. But once you learn the Word of God, you then have an obligation to get to a place that follows the Word of God. And that's the part where a lot of folks have issue. I don't understand why that is. Because like it was when you were a child, when your parents taught you certain things that were good for you, typically you did them. Unless you were rebellious. And some, so some folks are. The main reason, though, I believe that happens is it because it suits them the way they're already thinking. They're not looking for a church that's going to kind of work them and mold them and change them. They're looking for a church that they're going to be able to be comfortable in. And that's unfortunate. Once you're shown the truth from the Bible, the truth about anything Christian, why would you not conform? I, I don't get it. Mostly because of the certain amount of rebellion that's still in a lot of us, and myself included. Uh, that old sinful nature. It's still hard at work. You know, and, and, and I don't think anyone's exempt from that necessarily. Some people handle it better than others. But look at this next part. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're talking about the church. We're talking about Revelation 12, the candlestick. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Look at verse 14. Matthew 5 verse 14. The Bible says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Here's the problem in many Christians' lives today. They're putting things over their faith. They're putting things over their light. Just like it said in the verses that we just read. Neither do men light a candle and put it on. If you light a candle and you put something over the top of it, it's not going to do what it's intended to do. It's going to be obscured. And so when we look at Matthew 5 and verse 15, blocking and covering the light of Christ in your life is not what God intended for us to do. So many things in Christians' lives do exactly that. It might not be a literal bushel, but something blocks or obscures the light of Christ in our lives at times. And God said, I don't want that to be the case. I want folks, I want you to, your light to shine. But in Matthew 5.15 as well, where does the Bible say the light is supposed to shine from? It's supposed to shine from on the candlestick. What is the candlestick? Church. The church. Exactly. 
Now, in verse 15, again, neither do men light a candle, put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto, listen, look at this next part, unto all that are in the house. So what does that mean? According to Revelation 1 and verse 20, the candlesticks in that verse are the churches. So much, there you go, so much for those who say, I don't have to go to church to please God. I can just stay at home and do what I want to do and we worship our way. Well, God's word just shows you, right here I just showed you, that God wants your light shining from the church. The church is the place where your light is supposed to shine. Look at Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter number 11. Look at three verses here in Luke 11. Verse 33. The Bible says, No man, when he hath lighted a candle, put it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body is also full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. If thy whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the light as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. Question. How does a man's candle get lit? Yes, but by being born again. A man's candle gets lit when he gets born again into the family of God. He then is in the light. He has the light. Okay? When he comes to Christ... If we want our light to shine the way God intended for it to shine, then the church is the place God says your light is supposed to shine. Now, when I started looking at this, I thought to myself, wait a minute, wait a minute. But in Matthew 5.15, the Bible says, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. It doesn't say all that are in the world. It says all that are in the house. It says all in the house. The Bible says that Jesus is the light of the world. In Luke 11.33, but on a candlestick, similar to Matthew, that they which come in may see the light. It says, they which come in the house in Matthew. In Luke, it says, they which come in may see the light. Now, I'm going to tell you something that some of you may take issue with, but just listen. Here it is. Our light is to shine brightest at the church house. When we're gathered together in fellowship at the church house with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, our light will have the most effect. Let me give you an example. If I was up here tonight with a candle from a, let's just say a candle from a birthday cake and I was to light it, I would have what's called one candle power. Right? But if I was to have one of those fancy flashlights that gives off like 10,000 candle power, right? What's the difference? One or 10,000? What's going to shine brighter? Obviously, the 10,000. So, when God's people all come together in unity at the church, the light shines brightest in the community because all of God's kids are together and the light is illuminating out into the community and people start taking notice, what's going on over there? You know the verse, 
Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. It is now more important, it's more important now than ever before that the lost see Christians coming into the church on the first day of the week than it has ever been before. You know, a few months ago, maybe a month ago, I don't know, David, you remember this, we had some folks from across the street just pop in here one Sunday morning. And when they were leaving, I said, you know, how y'all doing? Yeah, we're doing good. What, what's going on? Well, we just wanted to see what was going on. When the church house is being utilized for what it's intended, when folks are not forsaking the assembling of themselves together, but we're exhorting one another and we're edifying through the preaching and teaching of God's word, and we're fellowshipping, and we're holding each other accountable, that is when our light is going to shine the brightest. And I believe it's now more critical than ever before that we do that together at the church house. You say, well, if we're all at the church house, nobody's going to see us. Well, you don't all stay here, but we can be gathering together on Sunday morning, the day of the week. You remember what the Lord did? He gave the Israelites a sign. Why did He do that? Because He wanted His people to be identified. What was the sign? Circumcision. He gave them that sign. He gave them another sign when Moses received the Ten Commandments and some of the other things. God gave him another sign. You know what it was? The Sabbath. That would be there for because when, when the people of the world saw God's people gathering together on an appointed day, they would be able to see clearly, oh, that's God's people. Those are God's people. Because they're getting together on the Sabbath day. That's God's people because they're circumcised. God wanted his people to be identified. And when he brought them together at the tabernacle... It was for their mutual benefit and for their edification, but it was also for the lost around the world to see. Hey, that's God's people. What are they doing? They're gathering and they're worshiping their God. I'm telling you, that's a lying, uh, that, that's a lost thing today. Most people on Sunday don't even think about church. And sadly, a lot of Bible-believing Christians don't even come to church on Sunday because they've got more important things to do. I'm just saying to you, when you refuse to see the church the way God sees it, you're in sin. God is never wrong. His word says we are not to forsake it. But yet we still today have, well, I don't want to go to church because... I, you know, there's no good church in my town. I can't go to a good church because there is no good church for me to go to. Look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, Revelation 1, verse 13, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the foot, and girt about with a paps, with a golden girdle. Who is that? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Where is he? He's in the midst of the seven churches. But yet you have people today who say, well, I can meet God anywhere. I don't have to go to the church house because they're all a bunch of hypocrites down there. So here we have John seeing the Lord. He's in the midst of the seven churches. He's in the midst of the churches in Matthew 18, and verse, or he's in the midst of Christians in Matthew 18, 20, where it says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. People will argue there's no good church around my home. I visited them all, and there's no good church. There's no good pastors, no good preachers, no good teachers. That's why we don't go. Let me ask you a question. If you needed a job, and there was no good job near your house? Would you sit home and starve and go broke? Surely you wouldn't. 
You'd do whatever you had to do to find work so that you provided and did for your family what you needed to do. I mean, if you're worth your salt. You'd drive farther if you needed to. Or you might even consider moving to where there is a good church. Amen? So these excuses that people use all the time for saying, well, the church isn't that important. I don't have to go there if I don't want to. God really doesn't require me to do that. I can worship God right at my house. John told us right here in the book of Revelation that our light is supposed to shine on the candlestick. The candlestick is the church. God said, I'm sending this letter that John's writing on the island of Patmos, I'm sending it out to seven specific churches. Why these seven? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. I suspect it was because, just suspecting, now I'm not telling you this is exactly it, I suspect it was because these seven were a good representation of the churches of that time. We know that's true because when you read the text of all the churches, you see things. We see things that God says, I don't like that. Stop doing that. And I want you to do this instead. You know, so, but God specifically chose seven. And he said, John, write the book and send it to those seven. And I believe it was because the Lord was challenging those seven to come into conformity with the way he wanted things to be. And that's really what the Bible says. We'll get to that in a future lesson. But folks, listen. The church is more important today than it's ever been. It's more important today that we gather together at the church house on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, than it's ever been. Yes, we can come out on Wednesday night and we can have Bible study. I think that's important too. I can't imagine why folks don't do it. When it's available, the only thing I can gather from it is they're working and they just can't get here or whatever it might be. And I understand that. Uh, but the first day of the week is the day appointed unto worship. And when you have Bible believing Christians that tell you that they love the Lord and they, they're, you know, they'd go to anywhere for him and, all, and they don't show up on Sunday morning. It's just sad. We need to pray for them. That they'll get their hearts right. Because that's what it is. It's a heart issue. they got more important things to do. We're having revival starting Sunday morning. Members required. Visitors welcome. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time tonight. We ask your blessing on the word as it's gone forth. And Lord, just help us as we uh, come to revival this weekend, Sunday, Lord, that you'd speak to each of our hearts. Lord, we're looking for you to speak to our church and to be challenged and to grow and to be edified, Lord, through the preaching. And Father, we'll thank you and praise you for what you're going to do, for it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.